Hey, this is Madeline Sklar. And Suze Cooper, and you're listening to All Things Audio. So we are going to talk quite a bit about subscriptions, I think, to begin with, Madeline. And um, Elon Musk was very much the first one out there with uh, asking people to subscribe for his content. And it looks like a fair few people have done that, haven't they? Yeah, we we heard about, I think it was about maybe a week and a half ago, all of a sudden they were turning on the subscription feature. And I was thinking, oh, this is exciting. And we talked about it a little bit last week here in All Things Audio. I was still waiting for mine to be activated. From what I've determined, is a two-part thing. So if any of our listeners have been trying to get this feature, first you have to go into monetization, either mobile or desktop, and just apply for a subscription. So you they have to first approve you that you qualify. And then once that happens, then the, the part two, which is the part I had done a week and a half ago when Elon Musk turned his on, and I was like, oh, I never did turn mine on. Well, you have to go through another process where uh, for web payments is through Stripe. So you have to have a Stripe account. And I had to go add my Stripe. I already had one, so I added it. And, and then I had this long wait. I've been waiting and waiting, Suze. And I'm like, what's going on? And all the meanwhile, Elon's racking up a whole lot of subscribers on his. This article from Mashable says he has nearly 25,000 subscribers to his account. I think he's only charging five bucks. So they're like, well, he's he's making some money. The cynical among us might consider that perhaps, you know, everyone's excited about subscriptions, but, you know, you don't want to roll it out too far. And anyone that's interested might want to subscribe to Elon to see what's going on. So if they've not got a, a full choice of an array of people that they could subscribe to, but to find out what it's all about, you can subscribe to Elon, then, you know, may, maybe that's part of it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, I... I mean, I think this is a cool feature. I think it's great offering ways for creators to monetize themselves on Twitter. I mean, this is something I think many of us have been looking for. You know, we had the tip jar, right? I remember when we got that tip jar, Suze, we were quite excited a few years ago, right? And I think the whole thing was exciting for like a minute because for like a week, I was getting tips left and right from people, but they just wanted to try it to see like, well, I want to support you, Madeline. I want to try this new tips thing. So sure, I'll tip you. And I was getting like, you know, $5 here, $10 there. Um, then after about a week, it stopped. No, everybody got it out of their system. Uh, it's nice that we have that feature. But unless you're t- reminding people talking about it all the time, nobody really remembers to do it. But I think a feature like subscriptions, it's like Patreon. It's a place where you want to keep providing value. Somebody subs- subscribes, it's going to be automatic. Every month, you're going to get whatever that dollar amount is that, that you set. In my case, it's $6 a month. Whatever that creator set the price for, if you go sign up, then until you turn it off, it's just going to auto-generate every month. So then you're just hoping that creator is just sending you all this extra VIP type of content, which... Uh, you know, I think it's really cool. And I think this is a much better way for us to go as creators rather than relying on the tip jar, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, we spoke a little bit about setting that amount last week, didn't we? You're, you're more expensive than Elon, apparently, Madeline, because I think he's charging $4 for subscriptions to his account. Equally, this Mashable um, article that we're looking at here, so they reckon nearly 25,000 Twitter users have subscribed. Um, so Elon's basically made around 100 he's going to make $100,000 per month so uh, I, I tweeted about this earlier and said well there you go he's seeing his pocket money roll in um you know it's it's yeah it's it's a good mechanic I think it will work better than the um the tip jar as you say because it's it's kind of it's a one and done, isn't it? That there's that, but you you do need to be able to rely on those creators to be providing that content, or be aware that they're not, and then stop your subscription. Like it's it's kind of. But there are lots of different ways, uh, different platforms that are doing that now. I mean, Patreon. Y- you know, I pay five dollars, and and sometimes think, oh yeah, that went out again. I haven't really heard from that creator, but actually, I don't mind because I support what they're doing overall. It doesn't really bother me if they've not sent me something exclusive that month or whatever. I'm just generally trying to like boost them and add to the creative work that they're doing so I'm happy about it but yeah I mean it's I I I think it's interesting and I I just wonder where it's going to go for the average Joe as opposed to someone like Elon who starts out with 
goodness knows how many followers anyway. <laughs> I mean, I don't think any of us are surprised he instantly got 25,000 subscribers. No. He's Elon. No. Uh, he could have charged any amount and he probably would have gotten it. Uh, you know, he could have charged more for sure. But but I think he's just trying to experiment to see, you know, what all he could do with it. Also, when you go and set your price, you cannot change it. So that's why you want to think long and hard. And I was talking about this last week when I was choosing my dollar amount. The reason why I came up with $6 is because if people subscribe through their mobile device, iOS, 30% goes to Apple. If you do it on your Android, then 30% goes to Google. I was trying to factor that in because I know most people are going to sign up on mobile, not desktop. If it's desktop, you get the whole amount. According to Elon, Elon says they're not going to take a cut for the first 12 months. Um, so I got it yesterday. It was turned on. And I have to say, Suze, it was turned on before I even knew it was turned on. I got my first subscriber. That's how I found out I had it because all of a sudden I had my first subscriber that joined. I'm like, oh, it's turned on. And then I finally saw the notification. It was done. Um, but I have to say a lot of people, Suze, are having problems subscribing. I've had probably a dozen people reach out to me yesterday saying it didn't work and they couldn't subscribe. Only a few people got in and I was very frustrated. I already reached out to Twitter, was able to uh, go back and forth on tweets with somebody. They told me this morning it was fixed, mobile and desktop. No, I still have people that are telling me they can't subscribe either way. So it's a little frustrating and I'm worried these are going to be people I will never get back because you know how it is when you go to buy something, you're excited and then the shopping cart doesn't work. You have to abandon cart, right? So then what happens? Do you go back? Usually not. So I've been proactive. I've been keeping a list of all the people that have reached out to me that told me whether it was DM or a tweet where they had a problem. So I'm keeping track so I can follow up. But, you know, for every person that reaches out, there's probably five others that did not. Yeah, that's smart, though, keeping a list so that you can kind of personally go back to them and say, look, hopefully this has been straightened out now. And would you kind of care to try try again? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a shame if it's buggy, as you say, you know, the the motivation to try it out is high at the moment because it's a brand new feature and people are hearing about it and it'll be on people's timelines. Um, for me, I I'd started to get notification, like in my notifications, I was getting recommendations like, um, you have you thought about subscribing to this person? I thought, oh, obviously it's being rolled out now. But what, what amused me was that I probably had about three of those notifications at the end of last week. And not one of the people that I was being recommended to pay for their content was I actually following in the first place. So you were actually the first one I got a notification for. And I, I shared that as a, as a tweet because that was the first time I got a notification that recommended me to actually, you know, subscribe to someone that I do actually interact with, engage with and, and you know, might consider actually subscribing to. But I thought that was quite sort of random, really. <laughs> Yeah. And that was cool that you sent me that screenshot. Well, here's something I do remember when this all first started. Again, it was about a week and a half ago when they turned it on. What I remember was that Elon subscribed to Mr. Beast. And that's when the whole talk of, oh, Mr. Beast is showing up. Like, I don't follow Mr. Beast, but in my notifications, it's let me know that I could subscribe to him. And it's because Elon did and that triggered it. And apparently Elon has adjusted the algorithm so that I think everybody's supposed to get notifications when whenever he does stuff. I don't know, something weird in notifications I had heard about. And he basically set it up so that if he subscribes to somebody, we're going to see it in our notifications. It's going to encourage us to go subscribe to that person. And I was seeing all that Mr. B stuff last week. So maybe it's something with that. If you're seeing people you would not normally there's somebody you don't normally follow, but you're like, why is it telling me they're, I could subscribe to them? I don't know. I think it's just a weird algorithm thing. I definitely want to have experienced their content and know what they're tweeting about and know that it was valuable to me before I start to part with some cash, you know, even if it's a couple of dollars, a couple of quid, you know, it's, it, you still want that, that taster. I need to know who that person is. So it just, I mean, I get that it's new and they're probably trying to work out how to get people to, to you know, subscribe and, and all that kind of thing. But yeah, it just seemed a little bit random out of, you know, I don't follow that many people, not that many people follow me, but out of the 2000 people that are there, they, you know, there must be at least one person in there that had got subscriptions that I might have considered um, signing up for. 
without being just kind of recommended random people. But yeah. And the way you'll know that you could subscribe to somebody is when you go to their profile, you'll see in the screenshot I have in the nest, it'll say subscribe at the top right corner, right above the bio. There'll be this new pink subscribe button. And you've probably seen it elsewhere um, because a few people have had this. I mean, they have been testing it. It was called Super Follows. It's been around for a little while, but it was very few people that had it. So you see that button, you hit subscribe, whether you're on mobile or desktop, and then um, a, a little screen. Let me put the screen in. I'm going to put in a nest here so you can see um, what it looks like. It, it's a little preview first. It says where there'll be a personal message from me. And it says, hey, friends, this is where I'll share the latest Twitter news as well as hip, helpful tips and advice. Are you ready to get Twitter smarter? So that's what people will see if they hit the subscribe button. And then when they scroll down, it says get bonus content when you sign up. And I put it's a VIP experience with my tips and insights that will help you use Twitter better, plus valuable how-to videos and a private AMA, Ask Me Anything, spaces, because we can do private spaces in here, which is one of the reasons why we really wanted to talk about this, because we've been wanting a way to do private spaces. This is how we can do it. And I, I think, Suze, that's what I'm most excited about by having this service turned on, this feature turned on is to do private spaces. Yeah, so I was going to ask you, like, what what is sort of your ideas or your plans for, for using subscriber-only spaces then? You know, I'm still, because it all happened so fit, fast, I wasn't expecting yesterday morning to wake up and all of a sudden it was activated and now I got to really figure out how I'm going. Um, I've been asking my new subscribers because I can do tweets and videos and whatever, like, as if it's a regular tweet, but just to them is... is no different when you go to compose a tweet and uh, in the pull down, you can, you know, there's like everyone, there's circle if you're using circle, but then now it'll say for your subscribers. And I want to be, <clears throat> excuse me, very much crowdsourced. I want, I want to provide the content that my community is most interested in. Yeah. I mean, that's the key, isn't it? Tailoring it to the audience. Absolutely. And I see some of them here live in spaces. Hi guys. Um, it, I'm excited about this. I, I'm going to mold this to the way the community wants it. I, what I came up with is, you know, I want to use my secret sauce, which is helping people use Twitter better. But I can also talk about social media in general. I've been use, using social media and teaching it since um, 2005. I've been doing digital marketing since 1996. I've been podcasting for 10 years. I have a lot I can offer and contribute. Um, so I really want to have the focus be on what does this VIP community want from me? And I could be totally wrong that they may not want more Twitter news and information and ways to market. They might just really want to tap more into how can I build communities? And I'm actually building, I haven't even really announced this yet. I'm building a whole new community that has nothing to do with my business life is something completely, and I'll talk about it soon. I'm not ready yet. And I, in just a very, very short period of time, I'm already building up a whole community base. Um, it's just something I've always been really good at. And I think it's just from my long number of years, uh, de you know, decades of digital marketing. So we'll, we'll let the VIP community dictate. And I want to come up f with a name for the community too, because I, I, I just keep calling them, you know, the VIPers or the VIP community. But I want to actually have like a cool name for them. Yeah, definitely need a name. I mean, while you're kind of flying and thinking of names and ideas and all of that, my application is still waiting for review. So um, it was possible for me to apply. So the UK didn't kind of have subscriptions. It wasn't open to us um, up until about five days ago. And then Andrew, thank you very much, uh, DM'd me and said, did you know they're open now? You can apply. And so I did. So uh, I have submitted my application and I'm now waiting I would imagine it's kind of a couple of weeks behind what, what's happening over in the US, whatever. So I will, I will sit and wait and see what happens. Um, but like you, I haven't fully formed an idea of what that might look like should I get access to it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting that, there, you know, as I say, it's not the first platform in the world to add a subscription or premium content layer, is it? But it's, uh, it's thinking about, well, you know, I'm doing things on other platforms as well. How can that complement, you know, how can this complement that and all those kind of things? Um, yeah. And as you say, maybe the content isn't, isn't the obvious thing that everybody knows you for instantly. You know, maybe this is a, a chance to 
dive into other stuff that you're, you know, highly knowledgeable about and, and, and share your expertise? I think the smartest thing you can do if you're going to sign up to to have a, sus- a subscriber community is to let the community dictate it for you, the direction. Look, you can start however you want. Doesn't mean you have to stay that way. You can you can adjust course and and go in the direction any direction you want. You know w- what value are you providing to these members, and they're not going to stay with you month to month if you're not providing value. So you want to think about like what can I offer. For me, it's like, well, people know me for helping with Twitter, using Twitter better, Twitter marketing. So I feel like that's the obvious reason they're coming in. They want to just have more access to me, um, get more information from me. I, I think it's such a neat way to do it here on Twitter. I was very conflicted months back, and that's why I never activated it until recently, because I kept thinking, what can I do here that I can't do with Patreon? And Patreon gives me way more flexibility, more um, options with tiers. With, like I could have a low cost, I can have a medium and a high cost uh, per month. I can offer m- the more you pay, the more things you get. And I still have an old Patreon. I actually still have a few people that still pay me for years over there, even though I'm not actively putting content in. But those are just my super fans. They they love what I do. And it's a way for them to support me. And I really appreciate it. And I do want to go back into Patreon so I just feel like, Suze, right now, this is just a big experiment. Is this worth doing over here? If I feel like Patreon could be better and I get more people over there, then I would in, at some point maybe encourage the people here on Twitter through the subscriber community to move over there. But for now, I'm just kind of dipping my toes in with this. I still plan to do some more some Patreon stuff soon. And I'll definitely report back and let you know how it goes. So do we think that this is going to impact free spaces if we want to call them that you know the, the kind of general spaces that are accessible to anyone do you think it's going to have any kind of impact that people are now able to take their space behind the paywall yeah I think it's going to be interesting to see how people decide to use this for me it just makes sense for me to just have most likely it will be an, a weekly ask me anything and because I have so much knowledge in so many different areas. It would be what what a cool way to just sit with my community for an hour and just ask me whatever you want. Let me help you however I can. And let's also help each other, you know, because this is community driven. Um, but it'll be interesting to hear what kind of ideas people get as a creator to utilize a private space for. I mean, what what I mean, you're great with all things podcasts, all things audio. I like that. I might take that. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, I, I've always loved podcast editing. I, there's something just so cool about audio editing. When I first started podcasting 10 years ago, I loved doing it all myself. And it took a while to get the hang of it. But then over time, I'm like, this isn't so bad. This isn't so hard. But I, it felt very creative, you know, building an episode through audio. Um, and I, I kind of want to get back into that again. But I would rather have somebody kind of coach me through it. So if you are using the subscriber feature and you are hosting private spaces in there, it'd be really neat if you were, you know, kind of like this. You're just like, you know, talking to us through audio. I mean, you're always going to have people say, why don't you do a Zoom call? Why why do audio? Why don't you do Zoom? Well, why not just do audio? People are very comfortable in an audio only setting. I've been doing live streaming for a very, very long time. People are very uncomfortable with video, even though you tell them you can have your camera turned off. You don't have to be on camera. There is something about video that keeps people from participating. Audio does not seem that way at all. People are so comfortable, whether they're actively participating or they're just passive. Something about audio is just, it's like I can still hear the nuance from the the people speaking. I feel like I, I know them well. I mean, it shows you why podcasting is so successful. You know, when I started the Twitter Smarter Podcast, people would constantly email me and DM me and say, and talk to me like they, like I'm their best friend because I'm plugged into their ears each week with an episode. And there's just something so special and powerful with audio. Here's another question though. So we've been waiting, Andrew has definitely been waiting for the moment when Elon spins up his first space and goes live. I mean, I think we can probably guarantee now that that's going to be behind the paywall, right? I think so. I th- I think that's how it's going to play out because he's building up this large community over there and that would make sense. 
but he should do a public one too. I think he'll do a private one first and then do a public, because the public one's what's going to really draw a lot of attention. But if he plays it smart, he'll use a public one to draw people in to go subscribe to him to go get even more from him over there. And that's one of the strategies I will most likely be utilizing at some point is using all the public stuff, public tweets, public spaces to draw people in to come join uh, and subscribe. And I see that, Andrew, I put it in the nest, this tweet where, and this was the problem we were having yesterday. So it shows in his feed, in his notifications, or, or just in the feed, subscribe to me, subscribe to Madeline Scholar. Click on it, and then it doesn't work. And, and this is what people were showing me so much yesterday, that this is what was happening. Some people could get to the screen to subscribe, but as soon as they hit subscribe, they would get an error. And there are some countries this is not available in. And, and if you go back to one of the earlier tweets in the nest, the about subscriptions through Twitter from the Twitter help, they have a list of country. It's a pretty large list of countries that do have this available for you as a subscriber. Like if you want to subscribe to me, it's in a lot of countries. I did have a lot of people over in Africa trying to get in and Africa is not on the list, unfortunately, at this time. Hopefully that will change soon. But there's no reason why this should have happened to Andrew. Uh, but other people in the UK are having trouble subscribing to me. So it's very frustrating. It's frustrating for me and it's frustrating for them. I'm worried that these people are not going to ever come back and subscribe. Like I'm going to lose them forever. And that's not a good feeling. But I'll definitely keep y'all posted. I'm really excited about this and I want to build it. Um, you know, I'm always in that whole mindset that just goes back many, many years of the 1,000 true fans. If you have a 1,000, this is for any creator out there, no matter what it is you do as a creator. It's for podcasters, musicians, artists, any kind of creator. If you get a 1,000 people, they're willing to pay you $100 a year, you know, which really, if it's something that's a subscription that's monthly, is is not really that much, right? If you get that, then in, in a year, that's $100,000. And so sometimes we just got to think of like, let me focus on building a thousand true fans of super fans that want to be part of whatever you're doing. And wherever you're doing that, you'll you'll be successful. And so maybe for me, it'll be over here, you know, using this new subscription feature. We'll see. Or uh, that plus Patreon, you know, don't know. But I'm definitely up for the challenge of trying this out and see where it goes. And I'll, I'll definitely be reporting back. Fantastic. Let's move on and talk about captions. We spoke a little bit last week about the excitement over Legion reporting that he had seen captions back in spaces. But then it was kind of a flurry of excitement and then nothing because no one could, else could see it and Legion then couldn't recreate it. So we figured maybe it was a glitch. Maybe they'd rolled back the app to do something and so they were showing again and then they weren't. But what's happening with it now, Madeline? You've done a bit more investigation, right? Yeah. So, you know, I see the tweet from Legion that that is back and he even did a tweet live in here in the space right now. Thank you, Legion. Um, I still can't access it. I tried it on desktop. I tried it on iOS, on my iPhone. I cannot access that at all. I know he's on Android. So, I, I mean, is it an Android thing? But he also says via the web. So I, I'm still quite confused by this. I know you and I have talked about the fact that captions are gone. We're not happy about this. We were, we were hoping that it's coming back. And we thought, you know, through these tweets from Legion that it is coming back. But I, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I can't access it. Yeah, I still don't see it, but there's clearly a screenshot there with our captions on it. So, Right. So he has it. Awesome. <laughs> Great. So if anybody else has got it as well, if you can like check it out and take a screenshot if you have, that would be great. <laughs> cool. Well, Clubhouse News. Um, again, another one. Uh, thanks, Legion, for tweeting this out earlier in the week. So uh, there's now the ability to pin houses in the latest update on Clubhouse. So, um, you know, it's a recognised feature now. Lots of people use pinning tweets. You can pin posts on Instagram. You can now pin your favourite houses so that you're not scrolling for ages to find that one that is right down at the bottom. Um, so, yeah, that's probably a very useful 
feature for people that are over in Clubhouse all the time. Also, Morgan says that there's been an update to the topics over on Clubhouse. The public room topics are now being auto-selected um, so that the creator doesn't actually have to make a selection. So it seems like AI is being used somewhere in the back end to sort of take information from the title or the event is- event description um, and kind of put all the information together and then come up with a tag um, for it. And it seems to be fairly intuitive, fairly creative, seems to be working quite well. So, yeah, that's another interesting bit of news coming out of Clubhouse this week. So our next bit of news is about voice notes, which um, I found really exciting, so exciting that I created a voice tweet about it earlier. Very meta of you to do. Uh, Yeah. It would seem that lots of people are using voice notes really regularly. So this was an Axios report that came out earlier in the week. Um, There are some stats out from a YouGov poll conducted by Vox, where the survey found that 30% of respondents were communicating via voice note weekly, daily, or multiple times a day. Um, Around 43% of respondents aged between 18 and 29 say they do it at least weekly. Now, I definitely use voice notes on WhatsApp and have been known to be in like a, a group chat where I've actually ended up listening to my friends having a conversation for a good 10, 15 minutes (laughs) because they're all there having the conversation and I'm kind of catching up later on and then I add my two pennies worth at at the end kind of thing, Um, which I, you know, it's quite amusing. Um, But yeah, I'm really finding that it's a a Marmite thing. Like you either love a voice note or you really don't like a voice note. And there's lots of reasons for that. Like the reasons people are giving me is that, you know, you don't know what's in a voice note before you hit play. You're not quite sure what you're going to hear. Sometimes those 15 minute rambles from your friends are actually completely irrelevant to your life and a waste of your time. Uh, But you can't, you know, skip, skip around or, you know, all that kind of thing. But it's interesting, you know, voice notes are a feature that's been added on to various platforms over the last few years. You can do voice notes now on Slack. You can do it on Teams. And this report from Axios kind of goes into that reasoning as to why it might be that that people are using voice notes more often. Um, They say, you know, it's this familiar yet complex storytelling. Again, you know, we all love to hook into that. If there's a story to be heard, it's, you know, really speaks to our our sort of fundamentals. Um, And also that what you were saying earlier, Madeline, about social audio, it's about being able to connect with someone's voice, hearing the pitch, speed, the pace, the loudness, their intonation. You can tell something of their emotions from what they're saying. So it's, you know, it's a much more enhanced version of a message than just having plain text. So it made me think, well, why not just pick up the phone, though, and just have a conversation with someone? And the only reason I could really come up with is that it's asynchronous. So you can leave that message for someone and they can then come back to you. And then my husband said to me, but isn't that just voicemail? And that just, that stopped me in my tracks. So that, that's where my thoughts ended. But I would love to know um, when we open the mics, like whether people love or hate voice notes and whether you use them. I would love to hear from from our listeners about that. Because yeah, I, I'm like you. I love just voice. I love audio. Uh, I, I need to get back into those audio tweets. I mean, you and I were really into it for a while. And it was so much fun. But I actually like to sometimes when I'm texting somebody, surprise them and just do it as an audio, which is so easy to do. I think many times we all just forget about it. Um, I don't really use WhatsApp much, but but I know that's a popular thing to do, like you're saying over there. Um, I definitely encourage our our listeners to just, you know, try it, play around with it. It, It's fun. Uh, Do an audio tweet. You, You probably don't realize I had a lot of fun doing the audio tweet earlier just because I realised I haven't done one for ages. And whenever we do them, we say, I love doing that. I was so excited when I saw yours. I'm like, so I wanted to be really meta about it and like reply to your voice tweet with a voice tweet. But Twitter doesn't let you do that. The only way you can do an audio tweet is you have to be in Compose. It wouldn't even let me do it as as a quote tweet, Suze. I was... So does, I thought by now they would have. But also we have to remind everybody, it's only for iOS. I don't know why they never added this to Android. Android users don't get to do it. I guess if not enough people use it on, on iOS as it is, then they're not, they're not going to roll it out. Um, but yeah, and even the people on iOS, 
like us who love them don't use it. So it's, it's frustrating. I need to remember it and, and use it a bit more. When it first came out, I was so excited about it. You know, there was no spaces then. There was no kind of audio element. And I felt like that was that was the first time, really, that audio had been integrated on the platform into Twitter. And I was sure I was going to do like daily daily diary or like some kind of podcast that um, would be on there and then I could record. And then, it, you know, as with Spaces, it wasn't straightforward to be able to do what I wanted to do with it. And it was clanky and clunky and then there weren't captions. So I took a break from it and all this kind of thing. But yeah, it was good fun to hit the button again and and uh, and do one earlier today. Yeah, it was cool. Yeah, that was very cool. So yeah, if you're on iOS, when you go to compose a tweet, you'll see there's a little waveform icon, little purple one in the bottom left and tap it and, and play around with it. It's fun. It's just a fun thing to do. And it'll definitely surprise people because it's not, so, you know, I always say, do things that everyone else is not doing. That's a great way to stand out on Twitter. That's why I'm doing more and more videos. I did, actually did a video. I was, I literally, don't hate me. I was walking my dog 10 minutes before this. I'm sorry. I was trying to get her out really quick, you know, just a quickie walk. And I, while I'm doing that, I'm like, make a little video to my new subscriber, my little VIPers and just say hi and um, welcoming our newest member. And I just joined this afternoon and, and reminding them like, I've done this a couple of times now, what content would you like to see here? Because you know, I think that's just so important. So when you're doing things that are out of the ordinary, audio tweets, video, your own custom gifts, it's a great way to stand out. So always be thinking about that. Now, I have invited Morgan up to speak because I'm hoping he's going to tell us more about Blue Sky Social. Hi there, Morgan. Hi, both. Um, Hi. Yes, certainly can. Um, have you been seeing people talk about Blue Sky on, on your Twitter feeds? I've seen you talk about it a lot. <laughs> I've seen people talking about it, but I'm bummed I can't get in because it's, you know, it's small and it's invite only at the moment. Yeah, me too. I'm there on the wait list, but I'm not. I'm not inside as yet. T tell us all about it. Yeah, so the background story is Blue Sky was something that Jack Dorsey set up when he was still CEO of Twitter. And what it was back then was a kind of research project, basically not profit or something like that, that was supposed to work out how to build a, in quotes, decentralized protocol that Twitter could then use later on. And Jack Dorsey, for those who remember, have had he has this view about what Twitter should have been all along. He he feels like it shouldn't have been a company. It should be a kind of protocol that all sorts of people could use and and build clients for. So that's the origin story. Um, that project went ahead, and they've got to the point where they've actually built an iOS client and an Android client. And they have quite a few users now. I mean, it's growing. And what it looks like, if you log on, is it looks very like Twitter. It's a really slick onboarding experience. You come in and you can see things you recognize, things that look like tweets. And you, you just know how to use it because you know Twitter. And you'll also see, I think, quite a few familiar faces. So it's a nice... Uh, it's a nice experience at the moment, and it feels very different to Twitter because, well, one thing is that there are no ads. The other thing, you know, quietly in this room is uh, there's no Elon. <laughs> there's just a lot of people having a nice time. So it has this very friendly vibe at the moment. So I think that's one of the reasons it's being talked about. Um, another way of putting it is back in November, I think, there was a class of people who left Twitter and went to look for somewhere else. And we know that they all kind of went to Mastodon. And Mastodon was interesting, but maybe not so easy to use. And I think now people are, having done that, and then trying to find something that is easy to use, and that they're ending up at, at this place called Blue Sky. So... The other thing about it is Jack Dorsey is still involved. He is one of three board directors. Um, so it still, it still feels very much like it's highly Twitter related and it's the closest thing to Twitter and has some of the DNA. That's really interesting because I was thinking about this and I was thinking, well, there are lots of, oh, lots of, there aren't lots of, but the social audio apps that we 
engage with them that we see, they all look really quite similar, don't they? But is there actually a different way of doing this? And and I guess what I was thinking was how might Blue Sky Social differentiate, differentiate itself from spaces and offer that more kind of unique user experience to some of the other kind of, I guess everyone calls them a clone of Clubhouse because Clubhouse was first. But maybe actually from what you've just said, it doesn't want to differentiate itself from spaces. What it wants to do, you know, is kind of show what spaces should have been, could have been um, in another era. Hmm. Yeah, so that's that's the bit we need to get to. So why talk about Blue Sky in this space? Well, it's what happened over the weekend is... Because this is a protocol and anybody can build a client for it, a developer called Justin joined Blue Sky and spent the weekend building basically a version of Twitter Spaces for Blue Sky. And the experience of it was really interesting because he was starting from absolute scratch, but was building in public. And a whole lot of us, there was about 60 people over the weekend who were in the one room that he'd managed to create. The one, they're called sky spaces, but anyway, the, the one space. And he was, he was basically building out social audio from scratch in front of other people over the weekend. And we were all there giving him advice and saying, oh, wouldn't it be nice if it did this? Or wouldn't it be nice if when somebody spoke, there was this glowing color around it? And he would say, oh, all right, okay. And five minutes later, we all refreshed the space and, and there it was. So it was this kind of, if you're into social audio, this exhilarating experience of seeing somebody build it again in real time over their weekend. Um, and this person, Justin, is really steeped in spaces. So he loves spaces, but also has many ideas for improvements. And obviously because spaces haven't really been worked on over the last six months, it was quite refreshing to end up with something that looks very familiar. It w it's beginning to work like a space is space. But he also has plans to do more stuff. So and I'm not I'm not for a second suggesting that, you know, oh my goodness, replace Twitter spaces with this. No, but it's a really interesting place to be if you have ideas about what you want to see and you want to, you know, try try them out with somebody and see if they're good ideas. So that's that's why I mention it. It looks interesting. We could see lots of different developers taking this protocol then and creating their own or different versions and maybe experimenting with that, a different look or a different format or, or whatever in the end. Yeah, no, exactly that. So I, I have a hunch that we might see something like a second wave of social audio, which is built on these newer kinds of platforms where the developer doesn't have to worry about whether the API will be cut off, doesn't have to worry about whether they'll be charged for it, doesn't have to worry about whether or not something can be done. They can just build it. So it's going to be this playground of people trying new things in what social audio client might do. And Justin is the first one, but I don't think he'll be the, the last one. Um, it's a bit like the early days of Twitter, when anyone could make a Twitter client. And there were lots of experiments. And of course, that's where things like the retweet came from or even pull to refresh, which we know from you know most apps now, was invented by a third-party developer building a Twitter client. So that kind of people experimenting with this is happening again. And they're doing it in social audio. So I think that's going to be really, really interesting to watch over the next year. And they're doing it at a time when large language models and all of that AI is really growing as well. So, you know, you put those two together and what comes out of that? <laughs> oh, absolutely. That's, if you want to get even wilder, I, I, I have some friends who are doing this and you can read about it on Twitter too, but one of the things that these large language models are beginning to be able to do, there's a thing called auto GPT or baby GPT. This is a way of, if you don't have the technical skills, GPT can begin to build programs for you. You can specify what you want in plain English, and it will go off and iterate and build something and then say, hey, how about this? So we're going to get to a place where it's 
much easier to build your own thing, even if you're not technically competent. So these two things coming together, being able to experiment and build on these new platforms, but also not necessarily needing all of the technical skills you needed before, means we'll probably see an explosion of experiments in kinds of things that are made. So it's a really, really interesting time. Yeah, I, I hope so. And I hope, I think we need a bit of um, motivation and a bit of difference in social audio. You know, if you, anything new that comes along now, and this is why I'm kind of talking about them all looking the same, kind of the TikTokification, if you like, of social audio, the clubhousification, I guess, if that was even a word. Um, but anything new that comes along has got to think about how it's going to motivate people to join and kind of engage and retain their users. You know, at this point in the social audio story, we're seeing big platforms like Spotify and Reddit completely walk away. Some of the smaller apps that we thought were doing quite well in the space have folded. Um, so it feels like it needs a new boost, an injection of something. Maybe this is exactly that and, and the moment for that to happen. So, yeah, exciting times again. And exactly what you described there, Morgan, with the, you know, the weekend where he was building it in front of you really reminds me of those early Twitter days. Um, I'm nostalgic for them. I do miss them. Spaces days, I should say. Yes, something something of nostalgia. I mean, if, even if this, this one doesn't go anywhere. I, I mean, I think it probably will, but it's just it's just an exciting place to, to be with a, a group of people who, you know, are doing this together openly and, and have views. And it, it's a great, it's a great experience. Thinking outside the box with like open possibilities. I think that's the that's the thing, isn't it? Definitely, definitely. There is having said all of that, there are still some very hard problems to solve. As we know, discovery for a Twitter space, it's in the app, but it's still a little hard. And there's a whole question about look, if you're if you're building these things as an independent developer, how do you then get distribution how do people find live things you know it's not built into the main blue sky app you have to go out to a different one to use it so that is a, that's still a whole question even if you can build it how do you get people to come the age old question with with anything that we're creating is always like how how can we draw people in and, and get people using it really interesting thanks so much for for joining us morgan and for adding all of that wonderful information to what we're talking about today um it's time to open the mic i think madeline don't you think yeah we would love to hear from our listeners i would love to hear from don as to why he said in the chat that he's on blue sky and he's not impressed so far i know it's not a very large community yet it's new it's invite only um, i'm still waiting for somebody to invite me in um, but it these platforms are always nice when it's new and it's not filled with a bunch of marketers yet that are ruining it for everybody and I would love to see the, the social audio aspect unfolding like the way Morgan's describing. Hey there, Don. You have the mic. How are you? Hey, Don. Hey, guys. How's it going? <laughs> Not too bad. Good. Tell us about your experience on Blue Sky Social then. So I've only been on about maybe a week, week and a half. Um, I guess my issue with it right now is is uh, the noise to quality ratio is pretty bad. Um, like I was on for a day, went back, logged back in. Uh, had 14 followers. They were all following 20 to 25,000. Now they're all 30 to 35,000 people they were following. Um, and I hadn't posted at all. And so my, my worry is that, um, you, you know, we talked about the bot issue on Twitter. Well, I don't know how all these people are, you know, following so many people so quickly, like, and uh, they're no, it's nobody I've ever heard of. It's, they're not like, uh, they're just kind of, they seem like strange accounts. And so I just, to me, it just feels a bit, um, it's really early right now. So I'm not going to like completely kibosh the whole blue sky thing, but it's interesting when Morgan was talking that, you know, everybody's trying to find a Twitter replacement, but it, it's so much of that seems to be a, a backlash against Elon and not Twitter overall. Yes. Twitter has technical issues these days uh, more than it used to maybe, but the reality is I think a lot of people are more rebelling against Elon than they are against Twitter because um, the issue with these apps, whether it's Mastodon, uh, Blue Sky, uh, all these decentralized apps is once you start scattering people outside the centralized app, um, 
I think that is really going to be a, a death knell for a lot of communities and th- because and discovery and because uh, that just starts getting complicated when people are trying to, um, you know, blue sky and then, you know, this guy developed that. It's almost like Linux or something in the computer world where there's all these spikes and forks off of the main application. And then how do people, f- you know, this guy does it differently than this guy and then this, you know, so I, I just think it overcomplicates things and um uh i think it's uh for, for me right now it just seems like it's very early days and um i'm not sure you know even with the the, the the accounts that were following me um i can mute them but i can't block them i can't like there's no mechanism there to uh to block anybody or anything like that so um we'll see how it goes but it, right now it's very early yes it does look a lot like twitter but i think um i think the decentralized app model doesn't really bode well for 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 building long term i think it just kind of um it's nice it's it's fun it's exciting because it takes us back to those early days but as far as long term i don't know how well it would it's going to play out so don have you seen any of these audio rooms yet that morgan's talked about i have not because i i said i log in kind of look around and i don't see anything worth (laughs) engaging in and then i leave and i go back and i go back to twitter (laughs) so (laughs) (laughs) okay Yeah. Um, so I haven't seen anything like that yet, but I, like I said, I'm not, I'm not by any means, um, uh, giving up on blue sky, but I mean, I'm, I'm about Twitter. I'm not really, I've, I've, I've gone to Mastodon. I've, I've spent some time there and have kind of just, I don't even have the app on my phone anymore. So it's, um, you know, I just, Twitter's where I hang out and, uh, I check these things out cause I'm curious, but, um, none of them have really, like you know, the thing with Mastodon, you know, with the decentralization is is discovery is hard. Um, the mechanism on how it works, the feeds and everything are really, uh, they don't really make a lot of sense to me. So, um, but no, I, I'll keep looking for for those audio rooms. But I think uh, uh, overall, nobody has come close to replicating what Twitter is for me personally, anyways. So uh, there's still a ways to go for a lot of these apps. I think. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. I really appreciate that. So are you um, hanging out for the the invite over to Blue Sky then, Madeline? I, w- I would love to go over there and see what it's all about. I would love to see these audio rooms. It's amazing how it looks just like spaces. I love it, which I think is smart because we're so used to that. Yeah, I suppose it is, you know, I'm, I'm saying about, uh, you know, c- could we do this differently? How could it look different? All of those kind of things. Equally, we are creatures of habit and we do like, you know, some recognition and some reassurance. And, you know, listening to Don speak there, so some of what he's saying is, you know, so used to having almost that um, the security fallbacks, you know, like being able to mute people, being able to block people, all of that. That's super important um, and, and has been throughout, you know, the, the kind of social audio journey, the different apps that have come up. It's something that we've discussed an awful lot. And if you go into uh, a social audio space where you've not got that now, it's almost like the foundations aren't there. It's shaky already before you can kind of really give yourself time to experiment with it and, and see what else is there. So it's interesting. We, we love the familiarity. However, I would love to throw off the familiar cap and throw on some blue sky thinking and just see, you know, perhaps social audio could look different um, to just having circles, pictures in, in bubbles and, you know, how, how else could it look? What else could it do? Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting time. Definitely. And once you and I both get access to Blue Sky, we'll have to play around with the audio feature. And Oh, sure. Just like we've done with the others. Absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you to all of our speakers who came on and uh, shared so much great stuff. And we're available in all of your favorite podcast apps. We're out there, uh, All Things Audio. You can also go to allthingsaudiopodcast.com as well. You certainly can. And you can catch us here on Twitter and use the hashtag allthingsaudio. And we'll pick that up throughout the week. So that's it for this week. But thank you so much to everyone that's been here in the space with us and those of you listening. And we'll catch up with you next week. Bye, everybody. 